60s, we, wa we wear a shako, which is French inspired. Post the Franco-Prussian War of 1871, uh, when the Germans are deemed to be the best military nation in Europe, we actually copy their spiked pickle hole. The original d design um, was presented to Queen Victoria and she said, no, that's too Germanic. Uh, given half her family is German, it's quite ironic, but she actually decides, no, we're not going to have that, and he adopts a spiked helmet, uh, very similar to the police custodian's helmet you see nowadays. The other commonality is the weapon we're carrying. Both units are using the Martini Henry infantry rifle. We'll talk a bit about that a bit later on as we go through. And there are some differences in drill. Um, the rifles actually, uh, because of the nature of the, the, the way that riflemen think, uh, they treat themselves in slightly different ways. They all move on the right hand side of the body, nothing on the left. They call their bayonet swords. Uh, there's all manner of various distinctions that uh, differentiate a rifle battalion from a line infantry battalion. So we're carrying out a number of rifle exercises here. Um, the idea behind that being that you actually start to train soldiers on a parade ground to get used to actually doing things in the kit. If you think about a Victorian soldier, you could join the army depending on the, the period as little as five foot four with a 34 inch chest. Height and chest regulations go up and down over the period, but at the low point, if you like, it'll be five foot four with a 34 inch chest. Nearly 60 pounds of equipment on their, on their bodies, giving them a nine and a half pound rifle and another two and a half pound bayonet on the end of it. Drills like this actually build up muscle tone and muscle memory. It means that they're actually used to wearing the kit, they're used to working in it, and that gets them physically fitter as well. They reckon that you would normally expand a chest around about two to three inches within the first uh, six months of actually being in the army from the physical fitness that you are actually being put into. As I say, we've carried out some rifle exercises. Now what we're gonna do is some exercises with the secondary weapon as a soldier the uh, bayonet itself. We carry the 1876 triangular socket bayonet, known affectionately by the other ranks as the lunger, because as we go through these exercises, that's what we do with them. It's not a cutting weapon like a sword. The whole intention is to actually lunge and use the point of it to do damage. Now the martini, as I say, is nine and a half pounds. You're adding another two and a half pound of steel on the end of it. So it's quite a weight in itself. Um, and what you're doing with the drills, is you're actually putting yourself in a position where you are throwing all that weight, plus the man's body weight, plus the 60 pound of equipment, all on that single point of aim. And in theory, you should be able to point through and pin a man to the ground with the bayonet. Now the drills here are actually quite arcane, uh, but they're actually designed for purpose. Um, things like this is stop somebody cutting you down with a, a cavalryman cutting you down with a sword. Uh, others are for actually more hand-to-hand -hand combat um, and drills like this do two things so say one they get you aerobically fit enough to actually carry out these drills but secondly and equally importantly what they do is they actually make sure that you actually respond to command and if you know that you're doing what you're told at the right time the man to the left and right and rear of you is also doing that then you know that in the heat of battle you're going to actually respond in the same way and it's that esprit, that court, uh, that camaraderie, and that knowing that you're actually all going to work as a unit that keeps the discipline and wins fights. And the British Army is quite keen to use uh, bayonets. In one of our wars in the 1840s, when our generals told we've run out of ammunition, his only response is, thank God I can now be at them with the bayonet, because he knows he can actually close and actually do harm with cold steel. And the Zulus at Isandwana give the accolade of killing a, a, a red coat with a fixed bayonet, the same as that as killing a lion. So we're a very effective fighting force when it comes to using our secondary arm. So I say we've carried out a couple of parade practice drills there, and that will be repeated ad nauseum three, four hours a day, every day, till it becomes automaton life and an immediate response to the command. What we're going to do now is move slightly away from the parade ground and start to look at the tactical evolution of the time. Warning, um, if you don't like loud bangs, you shouldn't really come to shows like this. 
Uh, but there will be some noise coming out of the end of the rifles in a few minutes. Um, it's fairly windy, so it should dissipate quite quickly. Uh, but if you're not happy with the noise, either open your mouth to elevate the pressure or um, put your fingers in your ears. It will move fairly quickly because of the wind. There may be a pause or two if we have to rush out and stamp out the odd bit of uh, burning ember. Um, shouldn't be a problem. We didn't have any problems uh, the last two days, but uh, having had the, the, the hay deposited left, right and centre over here, I'm not quite so sure this morning. Hopefully the rain will have dissipated that problem. So as I say, we're going to move away from the parade ground and start looking at the tactical evolution. And it's fair to point out at this moment that what we're looking at is Victoria's weapon of mass destruction, the Martini Henry. We are the world's superpower, and let's remember that. We have got the best kit in the world, specifically designed for its purpose, and specifically designed to maintain the empire. And if you put into context the, 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 the technological advance of the Victorian period, if you were a soldier with Marlborough at Marlborough in the 1730s, you would have carried a brown best musket. You carried that same brown best musket in 1815, and it became obsolete in 1837, the first year of Queen Victoria's reign, nearly a hundred years of the same long arm. From 1837 to 1901, we see 14 changes of long arm, each one more technologically advanced, each one more sophisticated than previous. We go at the start of Queen Victoria's reign from a brown best musket to the end of her reign in 1901 with magazine fed bolt action 303 rifles. Phenomenal changes of, of advance, specifically because we are the world's superpower. We're putting our money into our army and our navy to keep the empire. And so by the 1870s, we've developed the Martini Henry infantry rifle. It's the first general purpose breached over the British Army as a very, very effective tool when it's used in the right way. While we're starting to get some evolutions here, we can talk a little bit about the, the chaps in green now. We've talked a lot about the regulars, let's talk about the volunteers themselves. What's the volunteer movement all about? Well, we've always had volunteer soldiers in, in England right the way back to 1066. Some of Harold's, uh, Harold Gobbinson's people defending us against the French invasion in 1066 were volunteers. It wasn't a regular army. And at various times during this, this nation's history, we've embodied either both militia and volunteer movements to actually supplement the regular army. Last time it was really used in, in, in real sort of action, if you like, was during the uh, Napoleonic Wars in 1815. Although some uh, bits of the the uh, cavalry elements, the yeomanry, were embodied in the 1830s to actually uh, put down riots like Peterloo and other places up north with the Chartist movement. 1854 we go to war with Russia, our ally is Napoleon III. Uh, By 1858 he starts to become the bête noire of, New of Europe. People are worried about the French invasion, the possibility that we're going to be uh, attacked by the French. And in 1860, Alfred Tennyson, poet laureate, writes a poem called Form, Rifleman, Form. And that is actually encouraging the lower and working middle classes of, of England to actually take part in volunteer soldiering to defend Albion's shores against the invader. It's quite a strange period in the 1860s because they're not sure what to do with them. They actually think at one point of actually arming the volunteers with longbows because the Enfield musket doesn't have the rate of fire that a longbow does. That's why if you're entered with an NRA, you'll see the 1860 badge for the National Rifle Association at Bisley has an archer and a rifleman next to it. Our volunteers are thrown forward in a skirmish line. And the volunteer movement was taken up very, very heavily by the Victorians. It was something they aspired to. And you see straight away one of the problems of the Martini Henry. It's a black powder weapon, so there's no point in trying to camouflage yourself. The moment you fire it, you give away your position, there's a puff of smoke, everybody knows where you are. Then that's not a major problem for us when we're fighting against native forces, the Zulu, the Hadendawa tribesmen, because they're not armed with firearms, they've still got to come on to you. So it's actually the advantage to say, here we are, come and see us, we're going to say hello to you with a, a few rounds of lead. 
It does become a problem for us in 1881, when we fight for the first time in a generation against pseudo-European uh, enemies, the Boers in South Africa, where we get particularly bloody noses at Brutus Brut, Lang's Neck, and eventually at Majuba. Um, so we, we have problems there, and our musketry is called into question. Because in the 1880s, our tactics are designed specifically for colonial conflict. Martini Henry is introduced in 1874 for colonial conflict. It fires a .45 caliber lead slug. That's about the size of the top of your thumb. It goes in half inch, it comes out the size of a tennis ball. It literally leaves a bloody great hole in the person it hits. Because what you want to do is stop people coming on towards you. It's sighted optimistically at over a thousand yards, like all military weapons. Uh, the sighting is better than probably the person you're going to see and a weapon can perform, but you can actually shoot up to a thousand yards. It's most effective at 400 yards down when you're firing on the back sight rather than the ladder sight. At a hundred yards, it'll stop a running man in his tracks, put a standing man flat on his back. So it's a very, very powerful weapon. Our skirmishes are going to be deployed forward and say so skirmish rolls. Traditionally, have always been to go forward as a screen in front of the main body, engaging the enemy, looking at taking out their officers, their drummers, their buglers, their command structure, um, actually, and, and then working towards sort of working out what's in front of them. And extended all like this was something the British were very good at. Um, even going back to Wellington's time, we fought in line rather than in column. Uh, and all our tactics were to bring as many rifles to bear in the general direction of an enemy rather than have a very short frontage with depth. We'd rather have width with more rifles firing towards a, a point. And the extended order was common throughout the colonial conflict. Um, we only got into having to form squares and things like that for both uh, the post de Sanguana, second invasion in Zululand and in the Sudan, where the terrain was such that uh, really we'd had no other option. Uh, but mostly if we were going to fight, we were trying to fight an extended order with quite a weight of rifle fire. The Martin is capable of firing 15 rounds a minute, but you're only carrying 70 to 80 rounds a person. So you don't want to be firing that rate of fire for two reasons. One, it's going to burn up your ammunition quickly, and secondly, it's quite painful for you as the firer. So the, the normal rate of fire would be three to four rounds a minute. It, there's no need to rush a lot of it because most of your firing is going to be done at a different kind of enemy. Um, and although we're... Uh, engaging in extended order like that, the vast majority of our firing is done like this by section firing and volleys. Uh, the idea being that I'm not interested in being a particularly good shot. I don't care if I hit somebody this end of the arena or that end of the arena. I want to hit one of you. Because if I've got 20 to 30,000 Zulu or Handauer tribesmen coming on the general direction of me, I start firing at a thousand yards. I'm going to be hitting you. As you get closer, I'm going to be hitting more of you. As you get to 400 yards, I'm going to start amputating arm, leg or head. At 100 yards, if I don't hit bone, I'm going to hit you and the bloke behind you. So I don't care which one of you I hit, as long as I hit some of you. Because the intention with volley firing is to make sure you break the morale of an enemy coming in in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And this is a very, very effective weapon for that tool. Um, we're struggling a bit here. There's a bit of smoke going in front of us. Uh, if you're in Africa, with no wind whatsoever, you're going to have some problems with it. So what tended to happen, you perhaps fire by section as a ripple down the company. Or you fire um, uh, by fire, just to give you a bit of viewpoint in front of you. As I say, the Martini is developed specifically for that colonial role. And we're trained to do that. Of the 80 rounds of practice a year that we fire, all 10 of them are aimed rounds and the rest are actually volley firing. By the 1890s it goes the other way round. But 
this period, we're interested in body fire. So that's not going to hold, that's going to break it. And it works most of the time. It's a toss of a coin, it's Sandwana, whether we break the Zulus or not. We actually hold the chest of the Zulus for 40 minutes. They won't come on in the weight of the Imperial Infantry's companies firing at them. And if you start looking at the, the actual, just a very small section of infantry, a company's going to be four times that, a battalion, eight, time, eight times that, company size. It doesn't take long to work out the amount of lead going in a general direction. You see, the Martini is a very, very effective tool for that. Silas, the great South African game hunter, recommends it as the perfect weapon to bring a bull elephant down with. If you bring an elephant down with it, start to think what it does to a human being. Massive traumas to say it is capable of amputating arm or leg. Uh, the shock wave at 100 yards will probably kill you. Um, so it is designed specifically for that particular purpose. And although it's an effective weapon in terms of what it does, it does have its own problems. It has quite a vicious recoil as a black as a black powder weapon. It does actually foul quite quickly, and if it's not held properly, it will actually uh, cause a nosebleed. And again, if you're a bit lax with putting it into your shoulder, it can break your collarbone. After a short period of use, it starts to get warm, and uh, rounds can occasionally cook off. actually quite do a lot of uh, vicious recoil in terms of da damage to the individual. A raw drift where it's used for 12 hours in semi-continuous action. Uh, the soldiers there are actually firing from the left shoulder towards the end of the action as opposed to the right. They bruise them badly. They're having to uh, hold rank and hold the heat of the weapon. They're having to actually try and uh, keep the, the weapon fairly cool as they can. And you see, disciplined bodies like this are going to dissipate an enemy force coming towards you. If that's going to hit you a thousand yards, and you, you've got to cover that thousand yards, and every time you get closer to it, you're going to get hit by more and more and more, then you are going to start worrying about whether you're going to bother to come into close contact. I think one of the benefits of doing the last show of our season is we'll finish off what ammunition we have got. So there's a few more rounds going down than my commentary is used to. And the fire control is all down to the NCO. He'd actually know exactly how many rounds were fired out of the uh, rounds. So the chance of people running out of ammunition in, in contact is fairly remote. Even uh, chaps retreating from uh, Sadwana on the way back to the, the neck uh, would probably be carrying 10 to 15 rounds. You don't want to out of ammunition to retire. So the, the uh, Martini Henry Infantry Rifle was introduced in 1874. It's the first purpose breech load of the British Army. It's designed specifically for that purpose. And it's his active service in the Sudan and attempts to get General Gordon out of Khartoum. In South Africa in 1879 and 1881 against the Zulus and the Boers. And also the Northwest Frontier, India. It's a short service weapon, it actually comes in in 74, by 1890 it's obsolete. 
uh, because it's replaced by bolt action, 303 rifles that lead speed um, in 303, which then sees service from uh, 1888 right the way through to the 1960s with the British Army. So, uh, although it's a short service weapon, it's a very iconic Victorian weapon associated with that period. So as we're coming towards the end of our display this afternoon, uh, this lunchtime, we're going to give three cheers to Her Majesty Queen Victoria. So on side you go to find, if you'd like to give three cheers to Her Majesty, we've got lots of loyal taxpayers for Her Majesty Queen Victoria on the site. Her Majesty Queen Victoria, if hip the law, if hip the law, if hip the law, replace address. So on behalf of the Victorian Association, as I say we're members of the 1st Battalion Middlesex, the old Die Hard Company Victorian Military Society, assisted by our colleagues from the Second Queens representing today the uh, Surrey Rifle Volunteers, are all members of the Victorian Association, an amalgamation of the best of Victorian period reenactors in the United Kingdom. Uh, if you'd like to come and have a chat with us, we're further as across, if you're on your bar crawl around Detling, we're on the bar to the other side of the arena. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, high quality machine guns over there, a Gardner and a Gatling gun, uh, neither of which you're going to see many, that many of in the United Kingdom. And uh, if you'd like to talk to us about uh, soldiering, uh, most of us are veterans of serving at least one tour against the Zulus in South Africa. We've been reenacting there from the 90s onwards, and a number of us have actually seen active service in Zululand uh, and other parts of uh, the Victorian battlefields. So, on behalf of the Victorian Association, thank you for your time and attention, ladies and gentlemen.